Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to ASTO's webinar. Uh, it's a part of the ASTO Connect series. And the title of this presentation and webinar is Artificial Intelligence and State and Territorial Public Health. We're thrilled to have you here, and we're thrilled to discuss this really exciting topic. As we begin, we'd like to share a couple of housekeeping notes related to the webinar. Firstly, we want you to know that attendees do not have access to their mic or camera today. Please put any questions for our panelists in the Q&A box located on your Zoom taskbar. We have closed captioning available. To access it, click on the CC button on your Zoom taskbar or turn that feature on or off. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. I'd like to introduce the three featured speakers for the day. The first is me, I'm Jamie Pina. I'm ASTO's Vice President of Public Health Data Modernization and Informatics. We're also joined by Greg Papillon, who's the Director of Public Health Innovation here at ASTO. And finally, by, by Dr. Chris Mork, the Director of Public Health Informatics and Advanced Analytics and Intelligent Automation from GuideHouse. I'd like to share today's agenda. First, we're gonna cover some of the fundamentals of artificial intelligence. And then we're gonna discuss some of the documented use cases of AI in public health. Then we're going to review some findings from ASTO's rapid response survey about artificial intelligence. We'll discuss some key points and takeaways for public health. And finally, we'll share some closing remarks and give you, the audience members, an opportunity to ask us questions. Okay, let's discuss some of the fundamentals of artificial intelligence. And to start with, we'd like to offer something about being human. Humans have a natural affinity for non-human entities that display human-like behaviors. On the screen, you can see four examples. We have BB-8 from the Star Wars series. We have Lassie, a dog that was able to communicate with its owners to save the day. And Kit, the car that was featured in the, in the 1980s television series, Knight Rider. Kit was a car that could talk. And at the time, a talking car was mind blowing. And finally, another entity demonstrating human characteristics, two puppies wearing sweaters. Puppies wearing sweaters are timeless. And the thing that all of these entities have in common is that they are non-human entities that demonstrate human behavior. And if you're a human, chances are you have a natural affinity for these kinds of displays of humanism within non-human characters or non-human entities. So today, as we explore artificial intelligence and talk about some of the underpinnings of it technologically and practically, we want to give you permission to also enjoy that exploration and enjoy the magic that goes along with seeing human characteristics in non-human things. So let's start with a couple of definitions. First of all, what is artificial intelligence? So artificial intelligence, or AI, refers to the development, implementation, and use of computer systems that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence. AI describes technologies that make computers seem to act rationally. We'd also like to cover the topic of machine learning, or ML. Machine learning allows a computer to analyze data to do a task without being explicitly programmed. Common functions of machine learning are to find patterns, uh, find groupings of similar items, and to guess or predict an output based on a set of inputs. So there are two major types of artificial intelligence. The first is known as narrow AI or weak AI, and that focuses on performing specific tasks within a limited domain. That can include image recognition, speech synthesis, or playing chess. Narrow AI has been in use for decades. Think about things like decision support and Google searches. General AI is slightly newer and refers to highly autonomous systems that feel like they possess human-like intelligence and can handle various cognitive tasks across different domains. 
the major breakthrough that has enabled these systems are called large language models or LLMs. And a subset of general AI, and this gets a little confusing because the gen word is still present there, is, ge is a generative AI or generative artificial intelligence. That refers to artificially intelligent systems that can create new original content like text, images, or music. Uh, and that is accomplished by learning patterns and structures from the existing data. Generative AI is where we think most of the attention is being placed right now in the media and news stories about artificial intelligence. This is where ChatGPT sits. Okay, so I mentioned a moment ago that large language models are one of the key breakthroughs that have enabled artificial intelligence to be so prolific and popular recently. So we thought it would make sense to briefly break down what is contained within a large language model. This might feel a little bit like a information science or computer science lesson, but we're gonna try to make it simple. So these are the key things that occur to make a large language model work. And this is how a tool like ChatGPT provides responses back to you when you enter a prompt. The first thing that happens in the development of a large language model is that data is collected and parsed. And a typical large language model includes somewhere around a billion or more parameters. One of the reasons that these models are now popular and possible where they weren't previously is because over time we've developed extended computational power in our computing systems. The next thing to happen is that the architecture is defined for, for, the, de for the data that's collected. This is commonly in the form of a transformer architecture. What this means is that uh, the architecture enables the large language model to learn the grammar, syntax, and semantic understanding across all of those language models and tasks. Then attention mechanisms are defined. And these are a very key advancement in large language models. Attention mechanisms define the importance of the words that are assessed and define the contextual relevancy of each word within the context of the question or response. This has been a major breakthrough in LLMs as well. Then the model is trained. And during training, the predictions are calculated and the model is tuned for a specific task. And then finally, with the new model now trained, generation occurs. So this is where outputs are provided to the, to the, queer, to the person querying the model. And that's a quick summary of what an LLM is. Okay, so let's, let's look at a few key milestones in the history of artificial intelligence. Because while it seems like it's in the news a lot right now, it's not brand new. Starting in the 1950s, uh, the Turing test was developed. This was a test that was designed to assess whether or not a computer could uh, sufficiently respond to queries the same way a human could. Later on in history, IBM Watson's uh, system defeated humans in a game of the television show Jeopardy. And now in 2020, OpenAI, OpenAI released ChatGPT version three. And this gave uh, human-like uh, responses to people all over the world through an open source platform. And now here in 2023, we see the proliferation of generative AI in many forms not just in text, but also in image creation and other tasks. As we're thinking about artificial intelligence and its recent popularity, we thought it was important to share with you the technology hype cycle, which defines the excitement and anticipation that large populations of people have around a technology. And if you think about the release of any new technology in the last 10 or 20 years, Many of, of those technologies have followed this cycle. The beginning of the technology hype cycle begins with the trigger. So the technology is developed. And then for a period of time, excitement brews and everybody is thrilled about what it might be able to accomplish and where it will sit. It hits that peak of expectations, referred to as the peak of inflated expectation. So we develop almost an unrealistic uh, belief about what this technology can accomplish. Then, as use cases are developed and we understand the implementation challenges of a new technology, we hit the trough of disillusionment. This is where we realize, oh shoot, 
our expectations were perhaps a little bit magnified, but still we should remain optimistic because as we charge ahead, we, we enter the slope of enlightenment. This is where we start to realize, wait, no, it's not a failure. We just didn't understand its full implementation and how to do that. And finally, we reach the plateau of productivity where we understand where the technology sits and how it is best applied. And that is the technology hype cycle. And as we're thinking about this new technology and how it will fit into all of our different lives and work environments, keep this in mind because we have a tendency to be very excited and we need to balance that with realistic expectations. Now, AI is a potentially disruptive technology. And if you've not heard that term before, a disruptive technology is something that challenges established norms and can lead to the transformation of entire industries or sectors. Think about things like this, the onset of irrigation used in agriculture, which allowed us to grow food in places where we couldn't before. Personal computers came along and disrupted the mainframe computer industry and gave local computing power to individuals. The internet disrupted lots of things, communication services, and as we like to joke, enabled literally everything. Online streaming services came along and disrupted television and media. Smartphones disrupted telecommunications, photography, and navigation. And now here we are with generative AI, which has the potential to, to disrupt content creation, writing, programming, and many, many other industries and, and domains. So keep in mind that as we talk about AI, we anticipate that it will have a lot of disruptive, um, a lot of disruptive capacity. And now I'm gonna hand the presentation to Greg to talk about documented use cases of AI and public health. Greg, go for it. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, in this section, we'll build on those fundamentals by exploring areas where AI has been used in public health practice to date. So it's important to note before we dive into uh, this section that the this emerging field of generative AI is still fairly new um, and as a result, lacking in some of the documented public health applications that we might see from um, some of these more longstanding um, AI disciplines. So we'll start by exploring how AI has been used in recent years, particularly in the areas of public health planning, surveillance, emergency response, and health communications. And then we'll turn to a high level look at some of the emerging generative AI applications. Um, so uh, AI has shown the potential to be a valuable tool in various aspects of planning at the policy program and intervention levels in public health. Uh, it can function as decision support, as Jamie mentioned, empowering decision makers to uh, um, by providing insights and simulations that aid in making informed choices. Um, one example of this is uh, AI models simulating the impacts of beverage taxes and informing um, and uh, informing policy decision making through that. Um, there's also been documented success in using AI tools to better target the right populations with interventions, such as uh, in using AI analysis of social media data to help identify receptive audiences for anti-smoking campaigns. Um, one case example that stood out to us was the health department in Los Angeles tested an AI planning model uh, to help them select between volunteers to be youth advocates in an HIV prevention program. Um, which ended up outperforming the department's more traditional methods for selecting those volunteers. And lastly, we've seen some success stories in embedding AI tools within uh, the program planning process, such as with AI health coaches helping scale a program's workforce, or AI tools adding personalization features into health communication tools. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the use of AI in disease surveillance and outbreak detection is especially well documented. Um, the ability of AI tools to analyze huge quantities of data, uh, a wide variety of data sources, both traditional surveillance data sources and less traditional, often unstructured data, um, and its ability to model these data rapidly 
can be incredibly valuable in emergency situations. Uh, these capabilities shine in areas of predictive modeling and of syndromic surveillance. Uh, we've seen AI models perform well in predicting disease spread with both Zika and COVID-19. Uh, and the complexity of AI models can allow for the factoring of even social dynamics like information spread into their predictions. Um, syndromic surveillance, for those who aren't familiar, is traditionally the process of gathering data on patient symptoms to estimate disease spread before we are able to rely on disease diagnosis. Uh, but being able to complement uh, traditional syndromic surveillance and clinical data with any number of data sources like social media and news reports through AI tools really expands the impact and reach of syndromic surveillance significantly. Um, an example of this is an AI model called Blue Dot was among the first to identify and model COVID-19 using international news reports and official statements alongside airline ticketing data and animal and plant disease network data. Uh, more expansive AI models have also increased our ability to scour social media for early indicators of not just one specific type of disaster, but a wide range of disaster situations as they unfold, um, even if the AI model itself doesn't know what disaster it's looking for in the first place. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, which is a nice segue to AI's role in emergency response. Um, documented cases range from emergency planning and resource allocation to modeling the most effective evacuation plans um, to even using wearable device data to model survival rates and emergency service triage when resources are at their most limited. Um, this is also a time when information is needed most urgently, and in addition to the surveillance applications we discussed earlier, um, AI capabilities in image classification and real-time social media analysis can provide information to first responders or humanitarian aid more quickly than uh, traditional methods. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in the areas of health communication and promotion, we've also seen how AI can change how health-related messages are written and delivered. Um, now, of course, the new wave of chatbots like ChatGPT, Bard, and Bing have captured the public's imagination. But even before the release of these new this new generation of LLMs, um, public health practitioners were using less advanced chatbots in a number of different applications. Um, you, as you might expect, these chatbots tend to be focused on fairly simple tasks like message triage and automated responses. Um, but in terms of the breadth of applications, we've seen chatbots supporting a number of different public health um, programmatic areas across the past uh, 15 years or so. Um, the two most common use cases uh, have been around mental health services and COVID-19 support. I want to touch a bit on the design of these chatbots because there's some early evidence indicating success in using techniques like human-centered design, um, often also referred to as design thinking, um, and community-based participatory research to design chatbot services both with and for the populations most in need of a public health intervention. And an example of this is uh, Adondaga County, New York, where a team working to prevent unintended pregnancies, particularly among the Black and Hispanic communities, developed a chatbot named Layla uh, to provide uh, timely information about contraception. Um, so through focus groups and participatory design sessions, uh, they allowed young women from these communities to help design the chatbot, including its name, features, promotional images, and really, this is a great example of how leading with equity and representation can ensure that innovation doesn't further marginalize those most in need of a public health service. Um, it's important to note that more research is needed around chatbots efficacy and disease prevention and behavior change, uh, particularly with the rapid shifts in chatbot functionality. But even more rudimentary chatbots have shown promising results, especially in mental health applications. And uh, one other intriguing area of the evidence so far is in providing 
kind of a safe space for topics that can hold a stigma. Um, studies have found users uh, were more likely to share sensitive health information with a chatbot than with another human and less likely to report feelings of judgment uh, from a chatbot than from another human. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this brings us to the topic of the moment, generative AI. Um, while gen AI doesn't have the evidence base of public health applications that some of these longer standing disciplines do, um, experimental applications have begun to emerge. Uh, many other sectors are already augmenting the current workforce with automation of low risk, clerical and administrative tasks, and the public health community could benefit from similar um, applications. Uh, generative AI can also support a health communications workforce already stretched thin by helping to aggregate and summarize information on public health topics and news alerts, um, generating first drafts of health communications, allowing uh, health communication specialists to focus on more complex messaging or on fine tuning those messages and tailoring them to the populations that need them most. Um, many of the examples we shared earlier that rely on um, interpreting text data, a process often called natural language processing, um, are enhanced by these new generative uh, capabilities. One example that's been proposed is leveraging chatbots to identify and combat misinformation, particularly on social media. And in the research space, we see uh, increasing debate around scientific co-authorship with generative AI tools and uh, exploring the use of generative AI functions for pharmaceutical research and adverse event detection. Um, lastly, as we consider the evergreen challenge of limited healthcare workforce and capacity, which poses a, a regular risk to public health, we should note that a similar conversation is being held around AI and healthcare. Um, similar risk and opportunity debates exist in healthcare as in public health, but um, any augmentation of the healthcare system through AI could uh, provide dividends for population health. So as we conclude this exploration of the uh, use cases of AI and public health, it's clear that AI has already begun to reshape some elements of public health practice, um, but not others. Uh, and uh, this spans policy formulation to outbreak detection, emergency response, and health communication. Um, and with that, I think we'll turn things back to Jamie Pina to shift our focus towards an understanding of the, the current state of AI integration in state and territorial um, public health. Jamie? Thanks so much, Greg. That was really wonderful to hear that roundup of current uses. Now, many of the things that Greg described um, happened in practice, and many occurred as explorations in the research or perhaps even laboratory environments. Um, what I'd like to present next is uh, the results from a rapid response query that ASTO released and collected data um, on uh, to understand the use of artificial intelligence currently in public health practice. And to do that, we queried um, ASTO's informatics director's peer network. Now, our informatics director's peer network, or the IDPN, is a venue for state health agencies uh, to, to come together, uh, and it's all of their informatics directors and their data modernization directors and their staff uh, to share information on promising practices to network with one another, and to engage in meaningful discussions about informatics and public health. So like I said, to learn more about how those uh, individuals at health departments are using AI, we sent out a very brief query to uh, all of the members of the IDPN. And we got back responses from 17 different jurisdictions and practitioners within them. And the first question we asked is, um, are you using artificially intelligent tools in any way in your health department? And that could mean things that are sanctioned uh, by the health department specifically, or perhaps are you using those tools in your own individual productivity in order to accomplish tasks? And what we heard back was that 35% of those responding are using artificially intelligent tools to accomplish things in public health practice today. Um, most of the responses uh, described the use of generative AI, and some of the key things that we heard that they are doing are generating narrative text for reports, 
um, identifying anomalies in data sets, generating first draft communications for things like blogs, and generating job descriptions. So the takeaway here is that while we talk about AI in some of these more advanced contexts, um, there's also a lot of on the ground use right now. And that's important to understand because what it suggests is that um, the public health practice community is already embracing this technology, whether or not we um, provide any, any sort of regulatory effort or um, share more about best practices. Okay, the next thing that we asked about were barriers to using artificial intelligence in your public health practice environment. And 100% of our respondents reported that there are barriers to implementing AI. The first one, uh, the most highly uh, reported barrier is a lack of workforce skill or knowledge. So folks in the workforce are not sure how to embrace these technologies, not sure how to use them. The next was lack of established guidance around public health use of AI. So respondents noted that they haven't gotten any guidance about how to do this, so they're wary. We also heard concerns about AI-based data accuracy and whether or not they can rely on the, on the results that they're getting from artificially intelligent tools. They also noted there's a lack of evaluation data about tested use cases in this space. And finally, they noted concerns about equity and represent representativeness in the data, which is an important subject that we'll get to later. We also asked participants about their needs for support in implementing artificially intelligent tools in public health practice. And they all responded that they need that. So there's a strong desire in the public health community for guidance and feedback and training as they integrate uh, these tools into practice. The desired support that they described the most were a desire for virtual trainings on AI technologies technical assistance opportunities to help them integrate this work into their environment, um, a working group that they could join so that they could share ideas and knowledge, and finally, um, an AI subject matter expert panel to develop implementation considerations. So the takeaway message here is that public health practitioners are eager to learn more and would like assistance. We asked our respondents uh, if they had any ideas for potential use cases for artificially intelligent tools. And these are the things that they noted. They believe that AI tools could help with automating various processes that they take part in. A lot of this had to do with productivity tasks. They also noted the detection of anomalies in large data sets. Um, and uh, they view uh, AI as having huge potential in coding assistance. So if you are writing code in any language, you can harness the power of AI to identify uh, errors in your code or to even generate first drafts of code that you can then modify to achieve your task. Uh, respondents also noted that they uh, believe there's a lot of potential to use AI for first draft communications of many different things. And some of these we heard earlier, but I'll mention some additional ones. So we mentioned job descriptions, implementation plans, grant applications, uh, messages to the talk to the public about public health, um, educational material materials, and generating first passes of literature reviews. So these are all things that public health practitioners do often, and AI has the potential to provide them with a like a, a starting point with material and structure, so that they don't have to start from blank pages every time. And finally, we asked our members of the IDPN, uh, what sorts of transformative potential they think artificial intelligence has for the public health practice community. And these are some of their thoughts. They said that AI could be the mechanism that ties all aspects of health together, eliminating disjointed care. So AI could provide a linkage uh, across uh, healthcare providers, public health, and all the other entities that are involved in providing health care and public health action nationally. They also noted that AI could assist to combat public health misinformation by perhaps identifying uh, messaging that's going to a population that is known to be incorrect. They noted pattern detection in large data sets 
has tremendous potential, especially when we're not exactly sure what we're looking for, but we are suspicious that something is lurking within a large data set and we want to find it. Um, they also noted uh, predicting health impacts of community events and modeling events the way we do now, but with much stronger machine learning capacity. And finally, providing easy access to information. Um, generative AI can give a really nice start if you're looking to summarize a topic in public health. So those are some of the things that we heard from our Informatics Director Peer Network that we bring together through ASTO. And now to talk a little bit more about integrating artificial intelligence into public health, Dr. Mark will share some thoughts. Thank you, Jamie. I'd like to talk about some of the factors that we need to keep in mind when using artificial intelligence in public health. Next slide, please. One of the considerations relates to the nature of the intervention we're thinking about. When we're targeting individuals, privacy concerns apply. The store Target learned that lesson the hard way about 10 years ago when they sent a teenage girl coupons for pregnancy-related items, which accidentally alerted her parents to the pregnancy. Another consideration relates to what actions will be taken on the predictions being made. In the case of hiring decisions or creditworthiness, it's far too common that AI-enabled processes further disadvantage historically marginalized populations. Finally, public health is, by design, generally risk-averse. As such, decision makers are necessarily skeptical, and AI techniques that cannot easily be explained are far less useful than those that can justify the recommendations. As examples, a decision tree is pretty easy for a human to navigate and understand, but even the most effective neural network is really quite difficult to explain and understand what it's doing. After I've illustrated some of these risks in more detail, I'll conclude by offering some guidelines on how to help navigate those risks. Each of those risks also offers an opportunity to use AI responsibly and increase health equity. Guidelines for ethical AI, such as those listed here, help mitigate those risks so that we can realize the benefits of AI in public health. Next slide. Let me start with an example from my own work that highlights the difference between AI as applied to individuals and AI as applied to populations. Mission Daybreak is an effort by the Veterans Administration to reduce suicidality among veterans. On the left-hand side, we see a behavioral safety alert generated by an AI model. That model is estimating the likelihood that a veteran is at risk for self-harm based on several factors, including both health conditions and social conditions. The predictions made by this model, they constitute sensitive health information and need to be protected in the same manner as any other sensitive health information. Healthcare settings, thankfully, have strong privacy controls in place. But when you're applying these models in a Twitter or Facebook or some social media setting, the privacy risk has been elevated because these are sensitive health information. On the right-hand side, we see a choropleth map for a service network that includes Pennsylvania and New Jersey. That's the map near the middle. Within that region, we've highlighted those counties with greater aggregate risk for self-harm. In addition, we've used AI techniques to determine which social conditions contribute the most to effective interventions within each community. Now, these choices are deliberately biased to ensure that the community is receiving the resources that community needs. I highlight this because bias isn't necessarily problematic. It's the actions we take that matter. Do we push the needle towards more or less health equity based on the outputs of the model? And then once we know what the community needs, we recommend engaging with that community to determine how best to fill the identified gap. Techniques for addressing food insecurity in a suburban setting are different than those used in a dense urban setting. And only by involving the community can we craft interventions that are likely to be effective, regardless of the AI approaches we're using. I'm not going to claim that our approach is without potential flaw, but I do think we've avoided many of the common pitfalls, such as those illustrated on the next slide, please. 
The book that's shown in the top left, Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill, that's how I first became interested in ethical AI. And an example drawn from that book is shown at the bottom left. AI researchers developed a model of recidivism to be used when making parole decisions. The two individuals shown here have similar circumstances, but the model concluded that the woman on the right is significantly more likely to reoffend. This example showcases a few things using AI to make decisions about individuals, perpetuating social biases that have been baked into the model, and a lack of transparency in how the model works. And those are all characteristics of what Kathy has described as a weapon of math destruction. It is a way to amplify the power by using automation. Switching over to healthcare, the graph in the middle is taken from research that estimates an individual's likely healthcare needs in the future. So the easiest way to read this graph, I think, is left to right. If we cut across the line uh, roughly at one on the y-axis, uh, we see that a Black patient with one chronic condition is likely going to be excluded from what is, in this case, a high-risk care management program, so a program designed to help people who are at high risk of needing future care, while a white patient with one chronic condition would likely be referred for screening. Or moving up to four uh, chronic conditions, that Black patient would be likely referred for screening, while the white patient would be automatically enrolled. This is kind of the exact opposite of what we would expect. And the error that we're observing is the original researchers uh, chose to use healthcare expenditures as a proxy for healthcare need. They observed that because poverty in general, Black patients are likely to uh, have less healthcare utilization and therefore they're being labeled as lower risk for future healthcare needs. We can correct this. The graph on the right shows that we can correct this by choosing first the right outcome variable, the actual need, not looking at healthcare expenditures as that proxy. And they've also tested for post hoc bias, which means making sure that the predictions that are coming out don't have secretly embedded in them this, in this case, racial distinction. And switching to the next slide. I'll conclude by sharing some of my thoughts on how to protect against the common risks of AI broken into these four major themes. In addition, I recommend checking out the World Health Organization's publication on ethical AI. So first, I recommend establishing end-to-end -end governance for any AI project. This starts by establishing a clear hypothesis that you're trying to test, because when you skip that step, you run the risk of fishing around for a model that fits, even when that model doesn't make any sense. Uh, people with a statistics background will recognize this as a form of p-hacking. Also, when choosing an AI approach, it's necessary to assess the assumptions that are being made by that approach relative to the available data. As an example, in an early version of our work on Mission Daybreak, we used an approach that assumed that all of the variables would have equal variance. Our data did not match that assumption, and we were led to some erroneous conclusions until we caught our mistake. I'd also highlight in the last bullet that AI models are very sensitive to prior distributions. When circumstances change, it's not uncommon at all for an AI model to stop performing well. So regularly running test cases to help identify when performance is starting to grade, to degrade is essential. Second, it's important to collect demographic data and to verify that the data are representative of the population. If not, find ways to collect more data from those underrepresented groups. For example, early facial recognition algorithms really only worked on white faces because the training data were not representative. Another common mistake that I see is excluding the demographic data so that the model that you're producing is, quote, fair, unquote. This leads directly to examples like the parole example I gave earlier. I encourage you collect the demographic data, build the model without using the demographic data, and then test the result afterwards to see if the model picked up on any bias. So a place where I've seen this is a hiring model favored hiring employees who live close to where they're going to work. Seemed like a reasonable factor for making a hiring decision, but post hoc testing revealed this really meant that the model was favoring hiring white employees who could afford housing near those places of employment, 
and that they could only discover this bias by testing using the demographic data in a post hoc sort of manner. The next factor is to avoid proxy outcomes. So we saw this in the healthcare cost versus the healthcare need example on the previous slide. Another common error is combining several outcomes into one consolidated measure. So if any of you have uh, kids thinking about going to college, you're familiar with the college rankings from the US News and World Report. They produce a single score for a college, even though the factors that we care about when we are choosing a college can vary pretty widely. So I get that the single score is appealing. It makes it a highly marketable list, but it creates some market distortions as colleges are vying for just a few nudges up spending money on places that maybe the students don't care so much. It would be better in my opinion to develop different models and different rankings that favor different factors and allowing the consumer to decide for themselves how to combine that information. And then the last piece we've alluded to before. It's important that the teams who are developing AI models and deploying those systems be diverse to increase the number of perspectives that are being considered. Adopting human-centered design principles keep the users in mind throughout the development process. And then lastly, I recommend involving the people whose lives are most affected by artificial intelligence in the decision-making process. Include them in how you address the factors that were identified by AI. And I say this because AI works best when it is augmenting human agency. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Mork. That was wonderful. Um, we're going to provide a couple of closing remarks, and then we're going to get to some question and answers. So we're very much looking forward to hearing from all of you. If you have a question, please feel free to type it into the Q&A section uh, on Zoom. But here are a few closing remarks. So the first thing to note is that we are at the beginning of this exploration of using art artificially intelligent tools and resources in the public health practice uh, community. And there's a lot to figure out. There's been a, a pretty good amount of, uh, of research done, as Greg described, and there are some field tests and usages that have demonstrated efficacy. However, we also are aware that there is a need to um, ensure that we apply these tools in a way that is ethical and um, encourages uh, fair and just action within the public health practice world. So as we manage our risks and attempt to ensure that we don't allow artificially intelligent tools to create bias or other unjust action, we also need to make sure that we're seizing the opportunity and gaining the benefit of this phenomenal new resource that is rapidly becoming available in many cases for free to practitioners all around the country. There are growing levels of governance applied to uh, public health and artificial intelligence right now, as well as national efforts to drive the, um, the, the governance of the use of AI nationally, like we see in this report on the screen here. So it's on us as the public health community to create uh, our own narrative. How are we going to approach this? Like Dr. Mark suggested, probably the best approach is to ensure that artificially intelligent tools are augmenting and supporting human intelligence and human action and become a tool that is in that is available to us to make decisions and to drive the field of public health forward. And Greg, I'm going to pass the mic to you to discuss a little bit about where we go from here. Yeah, I think I think this uh, this conversation has made it clear that this topic of AI in public health is vast, and we consider this webinar to be a first conversation among several. So we look forward to your feedback on which of these topics you'd like us to prioritize for deeper discussion in a future webinar. Um, after today's Q&A, we'll share an evaluation link and QR code that will allow you to share your feedback on today's webinar, but also on what um, topics you'd like to see more of. Um, 
ASTO will also be convening an external work group of multi-sector partners to help advise the public health community on ways to implement AI in public health practice. So um, more to come soon on that, but uh, we understand that there are a lot of questions and I think the public health community alone will not be able to answer all those questions. So we look forward to, uh, to partnering broadly in that, uh, in that area of discovery. Thank you, Greg. And now we're going to move on to some Q&A. So we have some time now to accept questions from the um, from the chat. And I will sort of moderate this and pose the questions to all three of us. Um, and one of the first questions I see, I think is interesting, and we've actually already touched on it a little bit. So Greg, Chris, where are we in the technology hype phase of AI, where would you place uh, the current levels of excitement and realistic expectation um, regarding artificial intelligence and public health? I can uh, jump on that first. Uh, I think we are just past the peak of the, the hype piece and on our way down. And I say this because we're starting to realize that generative AI is causing some or has some issues. We observe hallucinations. We pose a question of generative AI, and it conjures up facts that it can't substantiate uh, until you really press the system to prove that its answer is correct, at which point it backpedals. Or we see situations where a task that generative AI used to do very well at, it is suddenly very poor at. I think that there are some standardized tests that in one iteration did very well, and the next one did very poorly because they tuned it for a slightly a different set of output or outcomes, and that had ripple effects in an unpredictable way. So I think we're just past and on our way down, but we'll see. Greg, your thoughts? Yeah, I would I would agree with everything you just said. I think it also depends greatly on where you are in your journey of understanding this new generation of artificial intelligence. I think there are those among us who have spent. Um, up and round of time studying artificial intelligence across the journey that Jamie outlined. Um, and then there are those of us who are just learning through an AI 101 of sorts webinar like this one about some of these um, capabilities and applications. So I think that that also affects how you uh, how you perceive um, AI's capabilities um, and uh, the future um, approach to it. I very much agree with the both of you. Um, the, the perception of where it lands on that curve, I think has a lot to do with the individual's background in information science, computer science, and generally tracking trends in emerging technologies. Um, but I do think at the, at the largest population levels, we are sort of just rounding the peak of enthusiasm and are now starting to understand the implementation challenges, which is I think why ASTO has been so proactive in trying to bring together all of us and with the series that's that's forthcoming. Thank you for your responses, everyone. Here's another question that I find very interesting. How do we prevent artificial intelligence from spreading misinformation? And I'll take the first uh, attempt at answering this, although it is a very complicated question. Uh, firstly, I think if AI or generative AI is used to develop content that's going to be public facing in any manner, it needs to be uh, vetted uh, by identifying sources uh, and citations that are existing in the primary literature to make sure that the way that the model is displaying information is accurate and ready for public consumption. So from a public health practitioner perspective, uh, using always your own research cap capability and making sure that what you're putting out there is accurate is, is the first way. I think secondarily though, um, there's a challenge with uh, the public using artificial intelligence um, or our gener generative uh, artificial intelligence to create uh, answers um, that appear accurate because they are pulling data from a, a broad set of, uh, of data but may not have the, the right context um, to really describe what's happening socially and politically. And that I think can change the response to have individ individuals arrive at the incorrect um, understanding of a particular topic, particularly when it comes to health. So I, I think there are lots of ways to um, help to develop models that are representative, that maybe help to reduce the risk of misinformation. 
But I think always the goal will be for individuals to fact check what they're learning through generative AI tools. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you two. Any other ideas about um, how we re reduce the, the possibility of AI spreading misinformation? I think when we're looking at some of the, the chat oriented features, they're very good at producing answers. Right now, they tend not to provide any citations that go along with that. So I think that one step is to provide those links back to some of the sources that they used to construct their answer so that the human who has received that answer can at least go back, although that runs the risk that that source is itself now generated by generative AI. Um, the other piece I would note is that uh, large language models are very good at being quickly tuned for special circumstances. So giving them a corpus of known misinformation so that you can then ask of the, the chat capability, is this information that I have just gotten something that looks like misinformation based on your analysis? Uh, and then you're essentially using that generative AI feature, that large language model, to vet outside sources, and that can be a component that plugs into an amalgam of chat capabilities, which is something we're starting to see emerge in the market. Yeah, I was really interested to hear your answer, Dr. Mork, because I think the, the scope of the problem, especially in places like social media, feels pretty daunting even you know with these these new tools at our disposal so um my thinking went straight to Jamie's first point which was you know ensuring that any information we as public health professionals put out with the assistance of something like a large language model is going through um a a formal process of of vetting the 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 sources of that information and 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 whatnot um but with things like battling misinformation with with the help of llm tools this is another area where asto is looking forward to engaging other sectors to to better understand what capabilities are that you know we and and our immediate partners may not necessarily know all of the ins and outs of so we're looking forward to that very much thank you both i feel like we could talk about that for a much longer period of time but let's move on to a new question um, artificial intelligent tools are creating some concerns amongst the broader population that they will replace knowledge workers and people who are doing actual jobs. Um, now, public health is already understaffed, so there is, I think, a, a concern that artificial intelligent tools could come and replace or supplant uh, people in the mix. Um, and the question posed by this, this uh, participant is, is AI going to replace people in public health? Um, I'll start if I could. Um, my my thinking on this is um, I don't want to position any of us as um, someone who can predict the future, but I would say um, the the most clear applications we've seen in our review and that we've been beginning to hear in these emergent use cases are um, ways to augment uh, the existing workforce, a workforce that is um, already um, stretched pretty thin. So uh, we see this as a, a method of workforce augmentation. Um, I would also say that a few of the things we've already talked about in this Q&A require and um, they require the use of public health experts, human experts, to ensure that the information that is being produced or um, documents being produced, models being produced are fair and accurate, and um, to ensure that we are including the right um, the right considerations of representation and um, and bias. So I think there is very much a need to have humans supervising the development of these processes, um, as well as um, vetting information and vetting um, development. So that's my thoughts. I would also note that historically, when we hear concerns about automation driving out particular kinds of workers, that what we see is that because the automation increases the efficiency of those workers, that increases the demand, although demand for somebody perhaps who is filling a different role. So introduction of the automobile does not cause all of the people involved in the transportation industry to disappear. It augments the demand for uh, 
transportation. We now have taxi drivers and truckers and all sorts of people involved in that industry. And I can easily imagine that the same thing holds true for public health. The nature of the work changes, but the, because public health becomes more efficient, there is more collective demand for public health. And we all benefit when we have more public health. Thank you both. And Dr. Mark, it was a reminder in your response, it was a reminder to me that we did our PhDs at the same university <laughs> because my response would have been very similar. Um, and, and what I'd like to point out also is that um, uh, when we think about um, the effects of an emerging technology on, on any field, uh, in addition to uh, the augmentation of productivity and the increase in productivity, it also creates a new opportunity for workers in that sector to learn to use that new emerging or disruptive technology and become uh, proficient in something that then enables them to be more effective. So I think that the public health practitioner of the future uh, will be very good at um, using artificially intelligent tools to accomplish certain tasks, just as we see in a lot of other sectors where they're leveraging AI. Um, and you know, I think this is analogous to any of the other, any of the other disruptive technologies that have entered public health, like electronic case reporting. Um, so I think that there's the potential to increase productivity and ensure that all of our uh, public health workforce continue to grow and learn new things. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's move on to a, a new question. And, and this question is, is interesting and it, it may be our last. And the question is about uh, AI having the capacity to develop new models uh, to identify cohorts of individuals in practice. And those cohorts could be um, patient populations or perhaps um, segmented across different parameters. Uh, we know that identifying populations that have been impacted in different ways by various health events is one of the key activities of public health practice. So the question then is, can AI assist with that modeling to understand populations in new ways? So one of the benefits of AI and particularly machine learning approaches is the ability to sift through many more variables than you otherwise would have been able to consider. Um, and I think this harkens back to the importance of having an explainable output because we can feed thousands of variables into a neural network and it can segment populations in new and fascinating ways and in ways that are not particularly helpful because we don't understand what those different segments comprise. However, when we're doing this with techniques that are interpretable, then we can look at the outputs and try to investigate what are the commonalities that might cause this phenomenon to arise. Is this a real segment that we should be paying attention to because there is a very real common basis? Or is it a statistical anomaly? As we're throwing in all of these the different variables simultaneously, the lessons we learn from the incidentalome become very real. We're doing many, many tests in parallel. And so things will pop out and we need to have the ability to interrogate that output and determine if it's real or uh, an hallucination, basically. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Okay, we're going to move on to ask all of you audience members something. Greg, could you take the mic? Yes. So as I uh, alluded to earlier, we would very much like your input on where we should focus future AI webinars. Um, we've talked today about concerns, um, ethical considerations, and the considerations um, that uh, underlie all of those topics. We've talked about issues of governance. We've talked about um, different use cases and emerging um, uh, generative AI use cases. If these or any other topics interest you, please um, share your input in uh, the link you see on the screen or the um, QR code uh, on your device, and you'll also receive this uh, this link in follow-up over email. So please help us uh, scope out the next step in this conversation. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to uh, you joining on a future webinar and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Hal.